Today we're going to talk about the uh, A36 Bonanza accident in Redding, California. It happened just recently, but I think there's some really important lessons that we need to uh, take away from it. So stick around. Hey, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire we're going to talk about the uh, recent uh, Redding, California A36 accident uh, that uh, just happened. Okay, it's a very, I think it's a very serious uh, issue, and we kind of addressed it in the Corona B36TC accident review. We're going to review this accident and see if we can glean some pretty good lessons learned. I think there are some that apply to any uh, anybody operating an airplane, but in particularly uh, the long body Bonanzas, the 36 series, uh, whether you have a turbocharger in it or not. It's uh, some some pretty important lessons learned. So. Let's go to it. This is an accident review of an A36 takeoff gone wrong. What is important about this video is understanding aircraft performance and the skill required to do the takeoff that you're, you're slated to do. And I think that translates into training and experience. Our prayers go out to the pilot, the passengers, and their families. And the names of those involved are just not important to this review. These folks have paid a bitter price. And we, as a pilot community, we need to learn from the mistakes highlighted in this accident to prevent this from happening in the future. It could happen to any one of us. So if, better, if we learn from them, basically we owe it to them that uh, we learn from what happened to them so it doesn't happen to us. So, that being said, what happened? Well, it was a heavy loaded A36 that intended to take off on a fairly short runway and it ran off into the runway. Two of the occupants died and two of them survived with severe burns. Early reports on this accident, as quite often happens, were inaccurate. And with time, the picture becomes clear. And it hasn't been long from the accident right now. I'm not trying to redo an NTSB investigation, I'm trying to glean important lessons from this recent accident. But from the early reports, this airplane was a standard A36 built in 1989 with an IO550 engine. And there were four passengers on board, all weighing over 200 pounds with full tanks that would put the airplane very near stock gross weight of 3,600 pounds. Uh, the exact weights are dependent on the actual airplane because I don't know that, and any bags or extra weight they were carrying. Uh, the airport where this occurred was at the upper end of a valley, it's in the north end of a valley, surrounded by MSAs over 9,000 feet. And the airport was approximately, approximately 700 MSL, and it was, uh, the runway was 2,420 feet long. The geography of this location raises a couple of questions right off the bat. One is climb gradients required and runway length for the operation you're trying to affect. So in this case, the takeoff was performed, performed to the north, calm winds, relatively cool, about 20 degrees uh, centigrade, uh, and approximately 12, and there's approximately 12 mile, nautical miles to the first mountain ridge, which is at 5,500 feet. And when you compute this out, this requires a climb gradient of at least 850, 840 feet per minute to clear that ridge. And depending on the weight, uh, an A36 can usually post that kind of performance, but you know, it won't clear it by much. The safer profile in this case would be to turn to the south, climb down the valley, and then after takeoff, and then proceed northbound. Uh, apparently this uh, flight plan was the airplane was going to Oregon. Uh, the point being, uh, the geography is difficult, a bit difficult for this airport. And there's a lot of houses, a lot of uh, uh, city around uh, the airport. Rising train, city, et cetera, it's an issue. The biggest issue, though, is runway length. Uh, from the original reports, I computed the people and gas load of about 1,280 pounds, which puts the empty weight at about uh, 2320. Reasonable for an, easily, uh, an early airplane, but unlikely. This is a 1989 model, and typically they're heavier and clock in at about uh, 2,500 pounds or greater for empty weights. Given the weather conditions, calm winds, relatively cool temps, density altitude was not a big factor, and I think it was something like 1,600 feet. Not huge. But using the POH appropriate for this airplane, I computed a flaps up takeoff to, to, for the takeoff roll to be about 1,500 feet, and a VR uh, rotation speed of about 73 knots. The associated conditions, though, require takeoff power to be set prior to break release. This is actually not a common practice in Bonanzas. It's little, little words in the associated conditions there in the chart. 
The next page in the performance section shows the numbers for a flaps approach takeoff, which is a setting on the flap panel and about, sets about 20 degrees of uh, flap for 24 volt airplanes is common. And VR for this configuration is 67 knots and the roll, takeoff roll, should be just over 1200 feet. So a big improvement. And again, takeoff power is set before brake release. Uh, that's the procedure. And what is not apparent in either takeoff performance chart is the Excel stop distance. This is the hard surface distance required to accelerate to a reference speed, decide to abort, and then be able to stop on a prepared surface. For this airplane configuration, that distance required for that day, a stock airplane, uh, was 3,030 3, feet, which is over 600 feet longer than the runway available. And in other words, and this is an important point, once the aircraft reach VR, it's committed to flight or running off the end of the runway, period, okay? But as so happens, so often happens, the initial ports, reports were wrong. Some folks reported this airplane is an A36 TC. That's not true. Uh, what is true is that this airplane was a standard A36 with a turbo normalized conversion and the gross weight was up to 4,000 pounds, okay? It had built-in oxygen, air conditioning, radar, TKS, uh, nice avionics, all that stuff, and all that bumped the empty weight up to almost 2,800 pounds. I'm guessing about 2,760. This is a very well-equipped, but it was a heavy airplane. And the pilot is reported to have planned the, the flight at the night before using the POH and computed that his takeoff plan would work with half tanks of fuel and his passenger load. When I work the likely numbers, the, it puts this airplane right at gross weight, so really close to 4,000 pounds. And the new data about this airplane results in a takeoff roll, that it's the turbo normalized airplane, it's a turbocharged airplane, a takeoff roll of about 18, just over 1,800 feet, and a VR of 75 knots with the flaps up. And a 20% hit, that's about a 20% hit on usual takeoff performance from a stock airplane. If the pilot had used approach flaps for takeoff, his performance would have been close to the stock airplane with no flaps. Okay, with flaps, he would have been equal to a stock airplane. Most importantly, the accelerate stop distance goes out to 3,370 feet, way more than the, that's available. The turbo normalizer doesn't, uh, doesn't kill you at density altitude, but what it does is it costs you extra runway. At high density altitudes, the break point is about 5,000 feet, and the turbo normalizer outperforms a normally aspirated engine hands down. And for the high altitude flying required by living in the mountains where this uh, is this location, a TN is actually a good choice. But, uh, and, but in reality, the CG is a very far forward and I'm thinking likely out of limits. I don't know this airplane, but that hurts performance as well. In my view, serious consideration needs to be paid to the runway required and strict personal rules need to be adhered to for operations in that environment. The hard truth here is that flying that airplane in that configuration with that load at that airport was not a good plan. There simply wasn't enough runway available in case something went wrong. And I personally am hard on the camp that you have to plan for it to go wrong. Okay, don't bet on it going right. It's gonna go wrong. So if I'm, I'm not gonna bet my life on something that I have no control over. The reality of flying is that we do operate in a risky environment. To deal with that, we need to mitigate risk as much as we can and develop plans for various contingencies. One of the most important ways that we mitigate risk is by training. The pilot in this accident had fairly recently completed his private and the majority of his time was in a Cessna 150. I'm not knocking that. We all have to start somewhere. I started in the 150 and I owned one for eight years. They're actually great little airplanes. But there's a significant difference between a, a, this kind of Bonanza and a 150. This pilot jumped straight into the most capable single, single engine retract out there as a, an A36 Bonanza, it's fast, complex, lots of new systems that were very unfamiliar. Essentially, it was a whole new way of flying. And with very little time and experience under his belt, it was a big, big jump to take. Apparently, the training he received was on the cross-country delivery flight. Just what he received in the, way of, uh, in the way of training is unknown, but in my opinion, this is me talking, flying cross-country as the checkout flight is incompatible with thorough training. It just is. Uh, it does not appear that the ABS or the BPPPP training syllabus was used 
at least not officially. Uh, my view, several local sorties need, you have to go through all of the maneuvers locally and uh, explore the performance corners of the airplane before you strike out cross country, okay? A good checkout, depending on the pilot's experience level, should take three to six sorties, possibly even more. And the remainder of the hours, for insurance reasons, could be obtained by a cross country, but the, in my view, the checkout needs to happen right away before you do anything else in the airplane. And knowing the performance of it is, is critical. So it's a question in my mind whether this pilot took adequate training, in particular, on takeoff performance and operations with this extremely complex airplane. The accident is evidence that he actually didn't. And uh, sorry to say that, but I think that's the truth. A witness to the accident reported that the airplane attempted to lift off and settled back on the runway approximately midfield. This would mean about 1,200 feet down the runway. And the record shows that, uh, or the wreckage shows that the uh, flaps were up and the gear was down. And the north runway at this airport been slightly downhill and the airport, airport fence is below the runway grade. That fence was damaged by the airplane as it passed. It veered slightly right in an attempt to go down a small ravine before crashing. So I think the pilot was thinking he could get a little more time by going down that ravine. But the airplane departed the runway surface at high speed on the ground. And takeoff performance testing with the heavyweight A36 that we did for the Corona B36 accident, uh, the takeoff accident, I found that takeoff roll can be increased by as much as 70% with an inappropriate application of aft yoke. And that's what happened in this, it did happen by witness report in this situation. A standard short soft field takeoff with the elevator full back is a very bad, bad idea in thir the 36 series of Bonanzas. That's my opinion. You can have a different one. I don't really care. I'm not gonna do something like that in a long body bonanza. Here's another complicating factor that's actually hard to assign a value to. The passenger in the right seat was a CFI. Purportedly, he was building time towards the CFII. And the only thing I know for certain is that this pilot had little if any time in bonanzas. I'm not gonna, I'm not knocking him or the pilot at all. And I'm not gonna speculate, speculate about who was flying. But I do think we could talk about the potential impact of a CFI present in the right seat for this takeoff. I've seen it myself as a CFI. With the left seat pilot seems to acquire more uh, confidence with a CFI present than they would have by flying themselves. They would do things that they wouldn't normally do because I got a CFI to bail me out. Uh, in a way, um, the CFI in the right seat offloads some of the mental checks and balances that the left seat might otherwise exercise. Uh, I don't, on a good-bad scale, I don't think that's good. The thing I want you to remember is that whether, whether you're a student or a grizzled veteran, if you're in the left seat flying, you are the pilot in command. You fly the airplane. Fly the airplane the best way you know how, and do not rely on someone else to save you. Fly the airplane, and that includes not flying it at all, if that's the best course of action, okay? You be the judge, and hopefully you'll think about it and judge conservatively. Given the configuration of this airplane at this airplane, airport, I think the only way to affect the takeoff would have been to hold it on the ground until very late with plenty of airspeed and then pop the elevator, okay? But frankly, and I think it would have flown, but frankly, that's not a satisfactory answer for me, or I hope you, because that statement overrides the concept that once past the speed of about 50 to 60 knots, an attempted takeoff is the only option. There was no abort. There's no abort option at that airport, that runway length. And what this mission requires, and, and, and does this mission require that kind of operation? In the case of a, you need at least 40% more runway to have an abort option? Without that extra runway, you have to offload people and stuff, period. And the alternative, alternative, if we can see here, is catastrophic. If it doesn't work at this airport, go to another airport, meet people, load up their longer runway, et cetera. If I was to distill this accident into a short list of takeaways, it would have to be one, training. Insist on a thorough initial training program. This is not an insult to your piloting skills. Follow a recurrent, and then once you've done that, follow a recurrent training program. In fact, Dan Greider's AQP program includes a lot of scenarios that cause crashes that aren't addressed in normal training programs, including this one. 
I'll leave a link to Josh Flowers down here, his website, Aviation 101, and he's got a really good copy of that AQP list that you can use. Training is fun, I think it is, and, explores the, and you explore the corners of your airplane, and that's a good thing. You never know when you might need it. And two, always have an out. If your flight or the maneuver today uh, does not have an abort option, if the weather or fuel or some other factor is a high risk, you gotta ask yourself the question, will this flight save the world? Is it that important? And if the answer is no, then modify the plan. Please modify the plan. Uh, for extracurricular work, uh, you can go look at that uh, Corona B-36 TC accident and uh, we, we can review some of that and you can see the uh, testing we did for the uh, takeoff with the different configurations and how it impacted the actual takeoff roll. So anyway, I hope you uh, enjoyed the video, um, the accident review video. I, I, don't, I don't actually enjoy doing these kind of uh, videos so much, but I do think they're really, really important uh, because uh, well, when I was growing up as a pilot, you know, people would talk about accidents and they'd be in the magazines and, uh, you know, things like that and, and hangar flying. And I really don't see that that much these days. I think it's really important. And uh, I think we can glean stuff from and save some lives between now and the time the NTSB releases their report, which frankly, I don't think is going to address what's really important to us as uh, GA, GA pilots that are put in this same situation. So. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, uh, hit like, uh, subscribe, and I'll put a, here's what the subscribe button looks like, it's going to be right down there, and hit the bell for notifications, uh, that, uh, that helps you for the next time a video comes out, and also, so if you want to support uh, the channel, uh, well, I appreciate it a whole lot, and I'll leave a link down below for the Patreon page uh, for your support, I really do appreciate that. So. At the, that about covers the, the, uh, the quick and dirty on this accident, and I hope we uh, can learn something from it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire.